As we're returning to our seats, let us turn to um, page 25 of our Bible to Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46, which is in page 25 of your pew Bible. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the word of God. You, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Would you pray with me? May the meditation of all of our hearts together, and may the words that I speak, O God, be acceptable in your sight, for you and you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As Christians, we know because we've read St. Paul and we've read the, the articles of religion that we Christians have produced over the centuries, that as far as the law of God, the moral law of God goes, the ceremonial law, the civil law, has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for that work of Jesus Christ that fulfilled the ceremonial and the civil law. I'm grateful there's no blood sacrifices here this morning. I'm really glad that I had bacon for breakfast this morning. Those laws have been fulfilled in Christ and St. Paul and Christian professions of faith remind us of this. But the moral law, The moral law still stands, according to St. Paul in Christian professions. The moral law still stands. That's why we'll still put, for instance, the Ten Commandments up and see those as moral laws that are still, still in force. Because the moral law was fulfilled in the living of Jesus Christ, we see how the moral law is lived. We know that the moral law displays for us the very mind of God. We also know that we fail the moral law. We fail in keeping the moral law. We Protestants particularly have said over the centuries that one of the other things that the moral law can do for us, other than revealing to us the mind of God, is the moral law can send us fleeing to Jesus Christ for mercy and for grace. But the moral law stands. When Jesus was fulfilling his earthly ministry, he summarized the moral law for us. And John Wesley particularly liked to refer to what we call the great commandment to remind us in its essence what it means to live Christianly and to live as Methodist people. That moral law is fulfilled by Jesus when Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if we do that, we'll do the best job that is humanly possible through the power of the Spirit and the operation of grace to live the moral law. This morning, we'll particularly look at you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Several months ago, our generosity team here at Wesley Memorial Church uh, came up with a motto that we're going to use for a year or so. 
That motto is, we are Wesley. And that motto is meant to do several things. It's, it's meant to remind us of the unity we have. It's meant to remind us of the common life that we share. I hope it is also a reminder for us to keep asking the question who we are and whose we are. When I say we are Wesley, there's certain things I mean by that. I'm not sure what you mean by that when you say we are Wesley, but since I'm the one in the pulpit this morning, I'm gonna tell you what I mean. When I say we are Wesley, first and foremost, it says to me, we are a people on a journey to do the best we can do with loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, And that's simply a biblical way of saying we want to love God with all that we are, all that we'll ever become, and all that we have. So I hope that when we hear that phrase, we are Wesley, I hope it will cause us to think about our identity as a congregation. People have assumptions about congregations. Uh, Every church I've ever served, people in the community that were not part of that congregation, they had assumptions about congregations. And human nature being what it is, we we almost never want the truth to um, impact our assumptions about people or churches. You know, some people look at our facility here and they draw certain conclusions about who we are as a people. I'm always saying to folks in this community when they remark about how beautiful our facility is that our people are more beautiful than our facilities. We need to make sure that people know that. I've even had somebody one time tell me that because they drove by the church on a Sunday morning and they saw the cars in the parking lot that they created a certain assumption about the church. And I said, that's not true. Come and see the, the diversity, the socioeconomic diversity, among other types of diversities that we have here in the church. So people have assumptions about all churches. People have assumptions about groups that they're not part of. And that's why I think it's important for us to make sure we know what we mean when we say, as individuals and as a congregation, we are Wesley. When I use the phrase, we are Wesley, I am talking about that we are on a journey to love God with all that we are and all that we'll ever become and all that we have. So obviously when I say we are Wesley, I'm I'm referencing the fact that we are a Christian congregation. We, We Protestants coming out of the Protestant Reformation, we have uh, consistently defined a local congregation in a very specific way. And I always tell people this when they come to me and perhaps they're moving to another community and they want some advice about finding a church home. I always tell them how we Protestants define the church. So when I say we're a Christian congregation, I define it like we've done it historically. We are a gathering of people, obviously. We're a gathering of people where the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments are duly ministered. That's the base level of what it means to be a Christian congregation. Gathering of people where the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments are duly ministered. So when you go looking for another church, make sure you keep that definition in your mind as to what a Christian congregation is. We are a Christian congregation. We seek the wisdom of God because we don't know, we know that we don't have enough wisdom for the living of this age, for the living of this day. We seek the wisdom of God. That's why we turn to the scriptures where God has revealed God's self to us. We know that we do not have all the answers, but we know who has all the answers. The Bible is central to who we are as a Christian people, obviously, but we hold those Christian convictions firmly, but we also hold those Christian convictions with great humility and grace and love. We need to make sure that we never present, and Christians are bad about this in this culture, we make sure we never present an obnoxious, 
portrait to the world around us as to who we are. Some people who come to Jesus missed out on that memo that says when you come to Jesus, try to quit being a jerk. (laughs) So we have Christian convictions, but we hold them, they hold us. We hold them with great humility and grace and love to all with whom we share. We, we, we don't have all the answers, so together we seek to grow. And I just remind you again of our core spiritual practices here at Wesley. We've had four for several years, and we finally woke up, thanks to Pastor Ken, and realized there was, there was one that was missing, so we added a fifth recently. Let me remind you of our core spiritual practices practices. I I hope that you'll commit these to memory. Prayer, worship, small groups. I hope that you're in a small group. Hands-on service. And then the one that we added recently was invitation. We want those core spiritual practices to exemplify who we are as a people. We are a people, when I think about our congregation, that is deeply, deeply rooted rooted in history, rooted in 2,000 2000 years of the Christian stream, rooted in this community. We were the first Methodist church in this community, founded in 1856. So we're rooted in history. We're rooted in the traditions of the past. We're rooted in the Bible. Our first pastor, our first preacher was Peter Dabb, who preached and and established churches all in this area. And we still, in our archives, in our historical room, we still have Peter Dabb's Bible. And when I see that, it reminds me that from day one, we have been rooted in Scripture. There's, There's a whole, used to be, if they haven't changed, there's a whole museum room over at Greensboro College uh, committed to Peter Dabb, that early Methodist preacher. I'm glad they have what they have, but we have his Bible. (laughs) We need to remind ourselves who we are. We're deeply rooted in this community. We're deeply rooted in in Christian history. We're deeply rooted in the Bible. Because we're deeply rooted in the Bible, we try to help each other abstain from idolatry. The human heart is an idol-making machine. We try to help each other to worship God only and make sure God's at the center of our life. We create idols. It can be materialism. It can be sexuality. It can be any sort of worldly ideology. It can be pride. It can be a false god. We are a people that keeps creating idols. That's human nature. But by the grace of God, we keep God central to our lives. We are simply a people in need, and together we're joining our hearts to try to grow in loving God with all that we are and all that we have. We are here today not because of who we are. We're here today because of our need. We come into this place not for the purposes of self-affirmation. We come into this place because we are united in our need of what God has to offer. We are all in need. We're all sinners saved by grace. We are all, as St. Paul says, fallen short of the glory of God. That's who we are. We're simply a bunch of beggars telling other beggars where to find the bread of life. As we said so often in the Christian community, as a congregation, we are a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. We are people, and we know this. We are people in need of change. We're in people, we're a people in need of transformation. That's why we're on this journey, to grow more and more and more and more and more into the image of Jesus Christ until we step on the other side and we are glorified and we become like him. That's why we're on this journey together. We are people in need of transformation, and we invite everyone that seeks that transformation to come and join us. We are just a group of people 
who join hands with each other as we seek to lead each other home. Heaven is our true home, and that's our goal. That's where we're journeying to. And we just join hands with each other, join hearts with each other, merge our lives together as we lead each other home. And we invite anyone on this journey who wants to make this journey with us, a journey of transformation, going from glory to glory, from grace to grace, until one day we step on the other side. Because we want to live and die as a people that love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. Recently, I was in another congregation, and they had an invitation printed on their bulletin. And it spoke to me. I offer it to you. Here's the invitation that we make to the community around us. To all who are spiritually weary and seek rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who, do, who struggle and desire victory. To all who sin and need a Savior. To all who are strangers and want fellowship to all who hunger and thirst after righteousness, to all who have been blessed and wish to give thanks, and to whoever will come. We open wide our doors and offer welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know our need. We invite all to come and be part of our fellowship who will join with us as needy people seeking the grace that God's transformation brings. God loves us so much. He will accept us just as we are, but he loves us so much he refuses to leave us there. In a few moments, we'll come to this table. We don't come to this table because we're worthy. We come to this table because we are not. But by his grace, he invites us here. As the old prayer says, we're not even worthy enough to gather up the crumbs under this table but because of his grace and his mercy and his desire to transform us, he invites us to this table. So, we are a family, and I think that for me illustrates a little bit of how I view us as a family, a group of people on a journey seeking to love God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. Like all families, like all families, we have traditions. We have traditions, and those traditions hold us together as a family. Your family, your biological family, has traditions, and hopefully those traditions will hold you together as a family. You may have traditions about how you celebrate Thanksgiving, how you celebrate Christmas, how you celebrate birthdays. Those are traditions that hold families together. We or Wesley, we are a church family, Christian family, and we have traditions that hold us together. We are a congregation in the Methodist tradition. We trace our roots, obviously, back to Jesus Christ, but in more recent days, we trace our spiritual heritage back to that evangelical revival that God birthed in England when, in 1738, on May the 24th, to be precise, that Anglican preacher, John Wesley, received an experience with the Holy Spirit. His heart was strangely warmed, and out of that, he and his friends around him went forth and preached renewal and revival to all of England. It spread to the rest of the United Kingdom. It spread to the colonies, and now there are over 80 different types of Methodist denominations, fellowships, around the world that are part of the World Methodist Council. And we are a congregation in that Methodist tradition. When I talk about being in the Methodist tradition, I, I'm very mindful of the distinctives. And they're not distinctives that no one else has in the, Method in the Christian world, but there are distinctives that we emphasize if you come to the School of Methodism Friday and Saturday, you'll learn what it is that we distinctively, emphatically emphasize, such as we, we believe in scriptural Christianity. We want to spread scriptural holiness to the world. We believe that every human being 
can answer the call of salvation. God's grace poured out from the cross is for all. And we believe in the fullness of the life of the Holy Spirit. And that's the emphasis that we keep speaking about as the people called Methodists that God raised up to renew the whole body of Christ. I do hope that you'll come Friday and Saturday. If you haven't registered, you can go on the website, our website, and register, particularly if you're going to be with us uh, for lunch on Saturday. We end about 3 o'clock on Saturday. You'll get an opportunity to sit at the feet of some of the greatest teachers in Methodism today. Even if you don't come to hear the presentations during the School of Methodism, I hope that you'll be here Friday at 6.30 p.m. for our opening worship service. Hope that you'll come worship with us as we kick the school off. We'll worship here in the sanctuary, uh, but I do hope that you're part of the experience. We want to show our community and our friends, people from around the region on Friday evening how we worship. I want them to experience our hospitality. I want them to experience the warmth of the Holy Spirit here in this place as we try to make an impact for the cause of Methodism throughout this region. Methodism, scriptural Christianity, worldwide invitation to come to Christ and fullness of life in the Holy Spirit. I hope that you'll be part of our experience. So we are a family. We are a Christian family. That means several things to me. I've shared those with you. We are no better or no worse than any other church. There's no church out there that should be all things to all people. We are who we are called to be. We're, we're seeking to be who we're called to be. And we are a people who seek to love God with all that we are, all that we have, all that we'll ever become. Next week, we'll look at the second commandment as we talk about loving our neighbors as ourselves. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.